KRN TV is delighted to announce the channel is now sponsored by the Compensation Claims Network. Have you been injured? Was somebody else at fault? Whether it was at work, on the roads, medical negligence or anything else, we can help. Compensation Claims Network is one of Britain's leaders in personal injury claims, with thousands of successful claims on a no-win, no-fee basis. Make the best of a bad situation and give us a call today to find out if you have a case. And mention KRN TV to get a discount on the fees on any successful claims. For the first 11 years of my life, I, I was uh, travelling in, in a caravan, or a trailer as we call it. So I was an uh, English Romany gypsy that would move around. I needed two dreams. To, to be a champion golfer or a champion boxer. And we, we had a knuckle fight that lasted over half an hour. It busted nose, lips like black eyes. One of my cousins said he's had enough. Then my uncle then comes out and goes absolutely mad. What the fuck do you mean he's had a fuck enough? Don't you fucking get this 10 year old, he's got to go to bed, it's dark. We'll fight again tomorrow. Age of 15, I, I break the course record I had at Oak Park. I uh, break the course record up in Kent. Um, Lunningston Park, I win the Own Park Club Championship. I had a few knuckle fights and they were nothing more than sticking up for my sisters and my family. It sort of built me a, re a fast reputation. People using you for crime and people you, you look up to thought were staunch, weren't staunch, not proper people. I got off on a case and I, and I was very lucky um, where I was facing a, nice, a decent enough bit of porridge. And, all around the country in Europe, and I stroke average 2007 73. 2011, me and my son go abroad, we play in the European Father Son Championship. Calm down, and he went birdie, birdie, birdie to, to win the championship. We voted Sportsbook of the Year by the Observer 2011. Yeah. And who was in second spot? Yeah. Tiger Woods. Hi guys and welcome back to KRN TV. Today, delighted to be at the home of Joseph Smith, also known as Gypsy Joe. Joe, thank you very much for inviting me down to your home today. Pleasure having you, mate. So Joe's lived an absolute crazy lifestyle up until this point, from <laughs> bare knuckle fighting, unlicensed boxing champion, brushes with the law, successful businessman, professional golfer, which is one close to my heart, and lots of other stuff in between. So it's uh, been quite a journey thus far, Joe. It has been a journey, a, a complete roller coaster, um, up and down. Uh, what can I say? Yeah, no, it's been that. It's, mm. it's been very much that, and, and, and there's been and there's down points in that, and there's there's high points in that. So it's it is what it is. Absolutely. So um, today, obviously, we're in Uxbridge area, but whereabouts did you grow up, Joe? Was it always in this sort of area, or no? I, I was. Um, I'm, I'm from the London borough of uh, Elmslow, so I was born in Isleworth. Um, Greater London was commonly known as West London. Um, that's my borough. I uh, met a girl from the Illington borough, so Uxbridge, West Straighton. And now my wife of 28 years. So I was sent around, yeah. Well so I just come across the airport basically. I'm, mm. I'm still in Greater London, West London, but my, my route's around though. So. Mm. You ended up, um, so you were born in Isleworth, but you ended up going down to Portsmouth, wasn't it, junior childhood? Were you down there? Yeah, we, we used to travel, so so um, for the first 11 years of my life, I, I was uh, travelling in, in a caravan, or a trailer as we call it. So I was an uh, English Romany gypsy that would move around. So whilst we had settlement during the winter months um, in, in um, Amworth near Alslow, uh, we would always be the traditional traveller for the decent months, you know, we would explore the weather, and uh, or chase the sun if you like, and Portsmouth was one of our, um, every year. Fantastic. Uh, you know, stays, yeah. And so, what, how did your parents support themselves when you're sort of travelling around then? Um, what sort of business was your dad into? Yeah, my dad's a scrap metal dealer, um, just like his dad and grandfather before him. And um, my mum would tell you, lucky ever, and you read your hand um, for a bubble two. And uh, that's how they made ends meet. And, hmm. and so while you were travelling around at those sort of young ages, um, 
What about schooling and stuff like this? Or was it more of a case for you working with your dad, helping him out the scrap more than going to school? Or did you go to school at all? Well, it's, it's an interesting one. That, um, I'm one of six, and uh, there's three boys in my family, for, uh, three girls. So um, I was a baby for eight years before my younger brother and sister arrived. Um, and the interesting thing was my, because we, we would do this, um, stay, stay, stay through, you travel through the summer, would predominance that was during school holidays. So if it extended a bit from that, my uh, bro older brothers and sisters, they, they, they all attended, they all attended um, infantry school, so, you know, um, but they never went to secondary school. Um, but I was the only one, um, I always went with my dad with vast predominance. Now and again, I go with my mum uh, on the odd occasion, which but were both wonderful ways of life, but I was a scrap metal man from the age of six or seven year old. Um, yeah, Brilliant. so never no schooling for me, mm. except um, the only tuition I had, we were standing some, on, on some land um, at Portsmouth, yeah, and this old gentleman arrives in a car, so we're being a bit vigilant. Who is this? You know, we're a very, very protective group of people, naturally. So yeah. any outsiders come in, we would want to, you know, be, be a bit more vigilant maybe than your norm, right? And uh, who's this old guy? I remember my parents saying, and my uncles and that, who's this bloke? What does he want? I suppose he's going to, from the council, maybe giving us a letter to move on or something. And he comes out in his deep Hampshire accent, and he's, I'm going to help you to read, and... My, my, my formula should be um, recognised by the government and the schools, but it's not. And so he proceeded to help us. And when we, uh, for a few weeks, and when we went back to Epsom and Surrey, where we also had some settlement where my, my mum's mum um, had resided, uh, he continued, bless him, to come all the way. And I mean, he must have been a 65, 70 year old man then. And he continued to come all the way from. Portsmouth, that's quite a journey in the old vehicles they had in them days, you know, yeah. so we're talking 40 plus years ago, and he'd make his way back and give his time to me and a couple of others, and if ever any of his family are listening to this, mate, I am eternal, forever grateful. He learnt me the pronunciations, a few words, six or eight weeks of that, and I picked up to read. That's brilliant. And I'm very, very happy now looking back, I can... I'm actually a good reader, I'm not such a good writer, but um, I'm a good reader and a mediocre speller, but I'm actually a good reader. What a saint of a man to do that sort of stuff. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's terrible um, how many sort of older travellers, uh, adults who can't read and write, and it sort of holds them back so much. Oh, no, absolutely, life, yeah. A lot of them are ashamed to tell people they can't read and write as an adult, and so they won't. Yes. You see a lot of them end up in jail, then they start to first read and write in those sort of places. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I, I had a cousin that had done the very same thing. He, he went a little bit of school early on, didn't learn how to read, and ended up doing a four or five year jail, jail sentence yeah. and learned how to read in, in jail. You know, But, um, you know, it's a big... Um, I saw my mum and not, not um, always asking. You know, if she went shopping, she knew the Oxo sign or the Bisto yeah. sign, etc., etc. But... She was, she was always forever asking, oh, where do I find this? What does that say? How do I get this? And she didn't see it as a, a barrier because she just built a, a, a way over it. But I look back now and it would be a hell of a barrier if I, if I had to resort to asking people to read things for me and look for things. You Absolutely. Know. And so thinking back to your childhood, can you remember what your aspirations were when you were older? Like what was it you wanted to be when you were older? Was it to follow your dad in the scrap business? Or were you thinking about maybe being a, a boxer? What were your dreams as a child? Well, I only had two. I only had two dreams. Uh, to, to be a champion golfer or a champion boxer. Perfect. I didn't have any other dreams. Uh, you know, the uh, all the other stuff. Um, I was never going to be a jockey. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, know, right, you, you need a big horse. You don't have to have a good <laughs> yeah, start in life. You need a shire horse and some, yeah. Indeed. And so let's talk about how you actually got into the golf and the boxing then. Because I was... Obviously, I've read that your granddad was obviously a, a big golfer and massive fan of it, and he sort of recommended you getting into the golf rather than the sort of traditional traveller routes as boxing and bare knuckle fighting. Is that correct? Was it yeah, it was. Um, my, my grandfather was an ex-fighter, a, a, good, a good, 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 good seasoned um, professional that fought for titles. Yeah, so that's what I thought it was unusual because he was a boxer, but then yeah. he's got a love of golf at his later age and yeah. maybe it's a better way to earn a living than Yeah, that. well he was a sportsman and he needed I suppose some substitute for sports like 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 you find in golf is such a substitute 
for many sportsmen, um, as you know yourself. So he took to the game of golf for a wager and um, for the love of the game with his friends. And I'll go along and um, caddy for him. And I, I just remember Hurley's memories, um, grabbing a golf ball out of his bag, teeing it up, deliberately letting them walk on some 60, 70 yards, whatever it was in them days. They seemed to be way out of distance. I was a little six or seven year old. And I take a swing at it and knock it away. And I just thought it was fun. But they then started remarking and they would look around and say, well, where's this ball come from? Somebody's, and my grandfather would be then quite used to it. So it's, it's my little caddy, it's my grandson. Brilliant. And he said, it's just at 80 yards. He's only, so yeah, everybody can knock a golf ball. Can he do it with regularity? Well, watch. So then I was encouraged then to play the par threes. Yep. Yeah, Brilliant. nobody's looking, it's played a par threes. And, and it just went from there. And I, I remember my first set of golf clubs, they were, they were a half set, mix set, but my grandfather got off me. They were so precious. You're so precious. I can, I can remember, yeah. And um, Rodney Hutton's professional shop at uh, Thames Dittonanesia Golf Club. And I remember it like yesterday. I remember going, I see in the putter, the clubs. I can remember the driver. I can still picture them now. And there was an old bloke that was Rodney's assistant. Not, not assistant professional, but an old bloke that helped him out. And incidentally, his name was Wally Smith. And uh, that was the name of my great-grandfather, Wally Smith. It was all coincidental. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And so you end up having a lot of success as a junior golf, didn't you? Winning lots of junior opens yeah. and stuff like this. And so yeah. at that point there, you're thinking, this golf is my future. This is... What yeah, do? absolutely. I mean, um, yeah, when my grandfather passed away on a golf course with me, um, watching me play oh, golf. So you're actually, oh, I didn't realise he was out there. I read that yeah. it was a heart attack, but it was, um, yeah, it was, it was actually watching, you. watching me play golf. I wasn't after a double bogey or something. Well, actually, I think it was after a single. Um, I started double <laughs> bogey. I was about 12 year old then, and he's made, made a wager on a couple of mates in the pub. And um, yeah, it's a double bogey bogey. Uh, and I pull off then on the third hole, so I haven't started great. Even then, I was a bit better than double bogey and bogeys. Um, and I pull off this beautiful eye towering nine on. It goes over the trees, draws onto the flag to about eight foot. I thought, bang, that'll make grandfather happy. And as I turned over to the right-hand side, he, he was on the floor, and um, that's when he had a massive heart attack. Um, and eventually went to his aid. It was ironic. He, he just had this... When he fell, with the, under the, when he succumbed to the... To, to the art attack and he fell. He, he was amazing that um, he had a perfectly formed boxer's cut. Being the boxer, it all seemed so, up, yeah. but it, yeah, I think it was one of his old cuts, but it looked yeah. so neat. It didn't look like he'd, you know, if you fall and bash yourself, you see sank a bit of thing, it was just a clean cut. I don't know, it was one of his old cuts had opened and he was down there, looked like um, an, old, an old, well, he was an old boxer. He looked like one that was just down, gonna maybe make the count, but it was his time he was counted out, unfortunately. I'm sure he's and, up there um, resting in, well, I hope he's up there resting in peace. And like I said, he, please went, God. he went on the place where he loved please God. Yeah, somewhere. Yeah, well, I mean, it was such a shock for me. It was devastating. Um, if you speak to me about it on, you know, if I go to it in depth, I still get very emotional about it. But um, when I look back, I look at the age I am now into maturity. He was 65, my grandfather. But I'm looking as I'm now 50. And I'm thinking if my time would be... Yeah, that's young, to go, it? to go, yeah. I mean, I'd like to do it at 85, but yeah. instead of 65, and yeah. <laughs> in all honesty, but yeah. if, I, if I could do it with one of my grandsons playing golf, I'd sign the contract now. <laughs> yeah, not you know, a bad way, you know, but, yeah. but, but it was, um, there's never no easy way to go, is it? No, and um, what about the boxing? Were you boxing throughout your childhood as well? Well, we, my boxing um, added a strange pattern, really. Um, uh, I oh, it wasn't so much strange. Well, yeah, I was running, I was running both my sports parallel for a lot, much of my life. They run completely together. Um, I had my first gym fight. I had a cousin who become a good heavyweight fighter. I mean, he was a serious heavyweight fighter. He didn't turn pro, but he, but he, he knocked, he, he knocked out a couple of British title heavyweight and contenders, Charlie Eastwood, and uh, Charlie loved fighting. So Charlie would, would just lay it on, lay it on, lay it on for the fun of it. Well, for the first sort of um, years of my life, I would walk away in tears, and I, because I, I was the baby of, um, I was a baby for eight years, so my brothers and sisters babied me, wrapped me up, and at six year old, I would get punched in the face, punched in the face, and I would cry. But you know, my cousin loved fighting. I didn't 
call him a bully really, I wouldn't call him that, I'd call him a man that loved fighting, he didn't know different, he was six or seven year old, he loved fighting, I didn't, and, uh, but lurking somewhere in the midst of me, I was a fighter, but it took something to bring it out, and this particular day, my other cousins, who I didn't fight with, <laughs> they were running around, um, playing on, on some settlement, we had an Epson on a field right by our site, they were running around playing, lovely and happy and I went for the door and my dad went grab me back where are you going I'm going out to play he went yeah and if you go out to play what will happen you'll get clumped again and you'll come back crying again and I went no I won't he said what do you mean no I won't I said watch I lit back watch and he went and I just started for the door and out I went and it was almost like clockwork went into the field to play and then my cousin went just to go and a dunk, bash, have that. No, it didn't knock him back, it didn't knock him down, it didn't send him into tears. It made for a Joe Frazier, Harley, perfect two kids matched. Two heavy kids, is four months older than me, tiniest bit bigger maybe, but two heavy fat boys. That, then we used to spar in the same gym, so we'd spar together and we'd knuckle fight by day, and we, we had a knuckle fight that would probably be deemed as brutal now by, by modern standards. Of course. But we, we had a knuckle fight uh, hedged on by adults or, oh, or yeah. appreciate it, nine, ten year old, nine, oh, ten year old. God. And we, we had a knuckle fight that lasted over half an hour. It busted nose, lips, had black eyes. Ten year old, yeah, we were eight stone each. That's the size of a small man. No gloves. And my uncle, what <laughs> seeing what what he would call fair play, my 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 um my cousin, his brother, who was a become a professional boxer, seeing him fair play, so edging on him from that camp, was under this behave yourself, lads, have a sweet, shake hands, forget about it. And we were at it, and the only thing that stopped that fight was daylight. My mum had called me to bed, I was nine, ten year old. My mum called me, I had to go. I went to go, one of my cousins said he's had enough, then my uncle then comes out and goes absolutely mad, what the fuck you mean he's had a fuck enough? Don't you fucking get, anyway, so down now it looks like they're becoming an almost an adult rel. He said, mum's calling to bed, he's ten year old, he's got to go to bed, it's dark, we'll fight again tomorrow. And, you know, this is, this is, um... You had to worry a gene bred into you. Yeah, I mean, but, but from my mum's side, um, you know, it's a serious fight, as in my dad's side. Serious fighters, but I wasn't a fighter, I was a, a nice little boy, and I think he stayed with me as my adult, as my cousin loved fighting. He continued love fighting as an adult. It's so different if you sort of developed the love of it from not liking it to start with as a Well, child, I, I love it as a sport, yeah, I love fighting as a sport. You didn't like the conflict and. Well, I just don't think it's necessary. You know, I'd always thought, well, like, um, you don't think it's necessary. When I got, when I got into this, when, when, when we pressed the go button and we're going. I think it's an absolutely wonderful buzz. I think it's a great adrenaline. I think it's second to nothing. Mm. You know, that are holding a four foot putt under pressure, because yeah. I could pretty much drive the ball fairly straight under pressure. Yeah. But getting a four, four, four and a half foot putter in, you know, trying to get that in with your nerves shaking. Yeah, when you can see when the it, hole outside your eye, yeah, it makes it a bit different. And when it goes in, you couple that with the adrenaline of having a straight man, and some blood's coming from you, and you're, in, you're into it, and you're perspirating a bit. Mm. And there's no way back. What a great buzz. But to be, to walk up the road and want to walk into a pub and just fight people, no, that wasn't in my, no. in my setup. No, I can understand that. So, and then, um, so like I said, you're doing, before that, with the golf stuff, you're winning all these golf tournaments. And talk to me about the sort of discrimination that they might have faced as a young traveller boy in a world that's not, that's sort of a middle class, upper class life, isn't it, in the golf? And, what, what about so what discrimination did you face as a child then? Well, yeah. So, so with, with the parallels by golf and boxing, we that that was me and my cousin's final knuckle fight. We then moved camp. Had a couple knuckle fights that then seemed like walks in the park after. As a kid, I'm still one of that. And who's this against other kids then? Uh, well, a couple of other uh, travelling kids and a couple of other actually non-travelling kids. And uh, they were like fights while walk in the park because the opposition was was way lowered. <laughs> we then found. We then moved off of that gypsy camp and then we, moved, we, we went into our house of settlement. So at this stage, my brother was a good boxer and, and uh, he had, I think, 63 or 73 amateur fights. Um, never ever got put down or stopped. He reached five semi-finals. So he was, a, he was a, really, a really good competitive fighter. I was then behind him 
Um, training, actually advertising. Which brother, for, which brother is this? I've heard one of your brothers is a monster. My, my, my old, um, the monster in size is my younger brother, John. Yeah, that's true. And he wasn't a boxer. My oldest brother, Aaron. Mm. Um, so I'm now on the edge of boxing competitively, actually advertising for fights because I was a big heavy lad and I weren't that many in my weight. So we're now actually advertising um, from Epsilon and your boxing club to get me fights. Then my brother has all the all marks, um, turning professional and banging stops. So that was it, cut ties. Now at this stage we had settlement around the corner from my grandfather. My grandfather loves golf. So my brother's the key fighter. Suddenly we're not going to the gym anymore. But we're going to the golf course every day. So um, we're in golf courses now. And then you talk about discrimination. So the first golf course was a municipal public golf course, which was quite easy to get into. Yep. Because it's a sort of a council pay and play um, situation. And we got down to a pretty good level. And as I say, my grandfather dies when I'm 12. I'll continue at this um, public golf course for about two years. So I'm now sort of maybe 14, 15, and I get offered some free membership at a golf course called um, Home Park Golf Club. It's now called Hampton Court Palace, but it yep. was then Home Park at Kingston. Yep. And um, so we have no hardly, hardly any practice facilities at the public. Now we've got these facilities. And before you know it, bang, we're away. We've got two practice grounds, perfect greens. And then suddenly you, you've just Put me in my element we've got exactly what we need we've got the right facilities the right course right so i quickly then go to age of 15 i i break the course record i had own park i uh break the course record up in kent um Lanningston park i win the own park club championship um beating a bloke who won it nine years out of ten a good solid scratch better player um bill cooley i beat him in the final as just a lad I then win the London Junior Open, which was a, it, it was only a prestigious event, only for a few years, but it was televised. I made a, they made a big noise of it. Dennis Thatcher had given me the trophy. Was then Margaret Thatcher was then the Prime Minister, yeah. so it was a big deal. And um, it was announced that the, the winner was 16-year-old Joe Smith from Home Park Golf Club in Kingston. And um, I finished tied first to the Grand Challenge Cup, Rolls and Georges. So suddenly there's clear success. Unbelievable. So I've been getting course records and stuff like this. I mean, I was from a golfing family. I was meant to be doing it. You were better than me as a junior, you know, winning everything. Well, I, I mean, I was, I was, do, I was doing okay. Yeah, with, with little tuition and just maybe the odd tip, you know, which I would take on board, you know. Um, it's crazy. Like I said, I was having lessons from seven years old. So you didn't have many lessons or anything like this. You just took to it like a duck to water. It, it was, well, my dad took me to watch a lot of live golf and I was a Bernard Langer fan and to watch Bernard's shot making live and Ballesteros, awesome. they would compete. I had a mm. great insight. I watched something, replicate it. Watch something, dream it up, get a vision. It was all, it was all in here. It was all in vision. Try it, pull it off. So it was all going great. Um, but there was resentment and um, barriers from my background. I've met at Home Park Golf Club. One million percent, one trillion percent. Um, I bet if you weren't so good, there wouldn't have been so many barriers. But when you're winning everything, possibly you're... exactly. If I'd have been just an average golfer and from my gypsy background because it's good golfers that they, they target as well as jealousy is resentment that's what so they just then put a bit of the background mix in there yeah. and they really come up with some some just manufactured lies they they, they you know if you watch a, a miscarriage of justice that the police has stitched somebody up yeah. and and they go to court of law and they believe that bloke's about hey, he done, he done fuck all wrong and um, i'm not saying he done fuck all wrong i was a junior but i didn't do the i didn't do the things wrong that would antagonise and up in it. And that golf club, in fact, I'd done sod all wrong. At my old municipal course, yeah, 12, 13, 14, I may have been a bit more mischief uh, up, to, up to wrongdoings a bit more. But at that golf course, I can tell you right here, right now, I put no foot wrong to nobody. But like you said, you said you were up to misgivings and stuff like this. Every junior is. Yeah. It wasn't that you were yeah. any different. Every junior was, but just you obviously got yeah. discriminated slightly against because you're background yeah. and you're doing so well. And I got asked to resign from the golf club and uh, I used to play when well, my junior mate was and Andreas Kikidas. He was he's a Greek parent, a nice boy, Andreas. Um, I think he become a can't remember if he become a golf pro or not, but he was a good player, a decent player, and uh, he was my sidekick, and he was a good boy. I was asked to resign from the golf club. Yeah, so I was threw out, right? Um, so it was only six or twelve months after Andreas then got a new sidekick, 
which is a policeman's son. And um, they then, Andreas didn't actually steal from the pro shop, but the, the policeman's son did. They nicked from the pro shop and, uh, anyway, they were caught. Cool. Nicking from the bloke that you look up to, the, 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 the professional was Len Roberts, a friend of mine, um, and, and a man I looked up to, he's a professional with a club. There were a couple of other professionals attached there, John Oskerson and Grant Harrison. Yeah, they were friends of mine, more, more Grant, and me and John are still friends a little bit. We see each other around, we're still friends. But um, I looked up to all the professionals and they took me under the wing. And said, just, just tweak your right hand a little bit this way and you'll stop it from fading a bit more. All right, and so little tweaks, and they were looking after me. And all I wanted to do was play golf, buy some stuff from the shop when I had the money, and I was happy. And when I was asked to leave the golf club, from these factored stories and a dispute that didn't even involve me, Len Roberts was furious. Six months later, two lads nicking out of his shop, got a six month ban. And the pro was witness saying, you tell me, and Len would hardly use foul language, and Len was witness using foul language, you tell me where your fucking justice is. If a kid had taken a T2 many in here, he would have told me. I have a policeman's son coming here, nicking out my shop, proven you give him six months. Six months he can come back and play here. Where's my mate, the other kid, the gypsy lad? Where has he gone? Gone for life. And um, it had a massive effect on my game. Massive effect. I, I can't... It must be devastating for you at the time. Oh, it was... Well, I come, out, I come out of that meeting in tears. You know, I could physically look after myself. As I just said, from seven year old I've been fighting. I, I, I'd got into scrapes with men at 15, 16, 14 even. And, I, and I'd beaten them in fights. I could physically look after myself. And I don't want to sound boastful as a fighter. Because I never ever want to boast about, I don't want to go down measuring myself and those things. I'm not boasting as a fighter, but I can tell you right here, right now, I could look after myself. But I'd come out of that meeting, that 16 year old crying like a baby. Because it was devastating to me. It, it, it's emotional bullying, wasn't it? It took away what I, what, what I wanted. And I don't know if you know, maybe you're a little younger than me. Um, but in them days, trust me. If you got through out of a private golf club yeah. and you went to the next one, yeah. you would have to, there was a background. It is almost like getting sacked from a job yeah. for thieving. That's what it was almost like. You go to the next job and your reference is thieving in the last job. You wouldn't get the job. And it was the same as that in a golf club. Trust me, it might sound a bit far stretched. Yeah. But anybody listening and watching him would understand if you come from my era of golf, you had to have a background check. So I was then in fear of, I went, I went back to a municipal course at Hounslow yeah. Heath. And again, we had bumpy greens, all the practice facilities, all my friends, yeah, that I could at least match, yeah, hold my own with them. They, they then went on, they had a crucial teaching and guidance and, you know, moving around, playing the big events, etc., etc. supported by their clubs. They went on to win European tour events, you know, friends of mine, and, and European tour cards and stuff. People like Warren Bennett, Gary Clark. But they are good friends of mine, and they were my sidekicks, you know. Um, a couple of other, I'm trying to think, uh, play, played in the open. But they all achieved stuff as a pro, and I was every every single bit. Every single bit as good as them. Mm. But good luck to them, but take away that little bit of thing. How do you fight and how do you, how do you get over something if you don't know how to get over something? Those crucial years. Me now as a 50-year-old, looking after a kid if it happened, I say, well, don't worry, we'll move that side. I know how to do it. I didn't know how to do it. And even in my parents. My, pa my parents knew how to look after me, they give me love. They were from golfing background, were they? They didn't come from golfing backgrounds. Yeah, it's devastating. Um, and so like you said, it's real, it took a real knock to you and end up sort of putting you off the game slightly for a, a few year period, is that right? Well, yeah, I've mean, become, through my inexperience, I'm a grinder, I'm a battler, I find a way. That's my, that's my nature. But I was so, I'll give them a two finger salute and almost like, oh, you don't want me, fuck it. You know, almost like, it, it, well, surrender wasn't in my, Armory, but it was it was a bit sort of didn't feel quite welcome, and I just went and and I actually just said basically fuck it for a while, you know. Well, that's understandable. Golf said fuck you, so you said yeah. straight back. Um, yeah. Might not be the best thing to do for you. Yeah. Obviously, what might have been, but for an eighteen-year-old boy, it's uh, it's not what you expect, is it? When you've been putting everything into something. Yeah. And then you get kicked back like that. Yeah. Well, well 16 year old in my case. Yeah. yeah. And so at that point, then, um, 
You ended up falling in sort of bad circles shortly after that, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, it, it, all, it all happened so quick. I can reflect on it now, but it happened so quick in front of me. It seemed like a flash. Um, I just had a couple of, I had a few knuckle fights and they were nothing more than sticking up for my sisters and my family, yeah. And, um, and probably on three of those occasions, four of those occasions, I weren't, weren't, weren't expected to win at those fights because they were adults and I was still the 17, 16, 15, 18 year old, 19 year old. And all my, all my what I call adult knuckle fights, right, was as a teenager. I wasn't fully developed or grown. But because I won those fights, I've beaten some seasoned amateurs and professional fighters, travellers, yeah. Um, it sort of built me a, a fast reputation. And not so, maybe, not so much that I could fight, but if I'm beating these people as a boy, by the time I'm 25, he might be useful, or 21 even. Yeah. Sounds like you're but, useful at that age. Well, I, I beat what was in front of me, and that's all you can ever do. You can't, um, you know, just say one thing I'll never ever do is boast about my fighting qualities. I'd never ever do that. Um, but I can only beat what was in front of me. What I can tell you is if somebody says they beat me, they would be lying, but I can't say that I'm good at this and good at that because I'm not interested in saying any of that crap. Um, but, but what had happened, then you get pats on the back and the wrong patronising, the wrong people massaging your ego. You know, people want to... It was just so quickly. Then that you then go out of a boy to a man, and you're still only a boy, really, and in the, in the maturity of things. And um, oh yeah, come around and we had a bit of work here. So it's before you know it, you're, you're doing stupid things, you crime. So so now no, I've not focused on golf. Um, there's no fights coming up, a knuckle fight. So I'm not really training properly. So you're just, just fucking around doing nothing really, and you're trying to suss out uh, where's the next quid coming from. You're meeting people in pubs instead of calves, if you like. You ain't meeting for breakfast or go to work. So before you knew it, it was just a, 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 you know, a bit of crime and people using you for crime and people you, you look up to thought were staunch, weren't staunch, not proper people. And um, yeah, so I mean, I, I just wish the, the most disappointing thing was, and there might be a message out there for you young guys, if you, don't, if you think your dad doesn't know best, more often he does. Trust me, more often than not, he does, right, yeah? And um, and, and that was it, really. It's just, you know, um, it, it, sometimes you don't always listen to your dad. If there's any youngsters out there, just, just if you have a, a safe, sound dad, yeah, listen to him, because <laughs> he is a, 99 times out of 100, they, they will be right. But that's, do we ever listen to our dad? It's an old cliche, it's an old saying. So, but I didn't have a, a, a 35 year old advisory around me or a 40 year old advisory around me, even in the criminality world or, or in, you know, and it just all went a bit out of proportion. Mm. And uh, I was a bit tired. I just got a bit tired of false people um, hanging around me. I'd pull off a bit of criminality and iron my money out, and they'd pull off a bit of criminality and say you were skint. So uh, I just, I can't be, you know, I just, I just got a bit tired of it. And, and my dad, my dad could see a wrong ending coming. And my dad saved me, you know, um, he, he, of all people he saved me, he said to me, one of your friends is heading off to Sweden to become a golf pro on the Swedish golf tour. Why don't you go out with him? And I see, I see it clearly now. I didn't see it then, but I see it. On the wall, big massive capital letters now. And my dad was saying, just get the fuck out of here and maybe golf might inspire you again and get you away from this shit because you're going to end up in a bad situation. You're going to end up in a violent situation where it's going to end badly or somebody else end badly or something. You're going to get a seven, eight or a 10. And I could see it now, but I couldn't see it then. But I took his advice and because I moved away from home a bit and I went Sorry back. Sorry to interrupt you, so prior to then you did have a little bit of a scare, didn't you, in the courts? Or, or was it in the police station? Was there sort of a close brush where you could have ended up going to jail? Oh, very much so, yeah. yeah. You know, I, um, I, 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 I got off on the case and I, and I was very lucky um, where I was facing a, nice, a decent enough bit of porridge. And other things as well where it could have went wrong, you know, you, you reflect on them now, you know, like... like um, Example fights can go wrong, you know. 
I've innocently, when I say innocently, threw right-handers at people and they've been out cold for 20 minutes. Who's to say they're going to come round? Shit, yeah. Yeah, who's to say that, who's to say that the right hand couldn't have been hit me and knocked me out and killed me? When you reflect on it, it's not to say that I'm stronger than that bloke. Mm. But people do hit people outside of pubs and kill them. And that can happen both ways. In a violent altercation, you, you, you have no guarantee to say that you're going to win it. Two great world champions go in a boxing ring, one dies. There's no, there's no guarantee in it. But when I reflected on it, um, I could see where my dad was coming from. And I did have a brush with the law, and it was that close. It was that close encounter. But well, you ain't going to keep getting lucky. Um, he said, "Why don't you you go and be a golf pro?" So I agreed. So I come back to around my side of London, knocking around with some old mates, and I turned professional. I went out to Sweden, <laughs> and uh, but you got to bear in mind this skillful young lad, full of confidence, shoulders back. Feels like he's six and a half foot tall when he's only six foot tall. Yeah, walking the fairways, right? And all the skills and all the nerves and all that. I've now lived four or five years of a different life. Yeah. So I've now... Playing catch up, is it? And yeah, but I'm now, now facing... Top. Professionals. Yeah. Top players who have been seasoned. I mean, at 16 I was a very good golfer. A brilliant young golfer. Um, not as good as some, arguably, but but you know, I'm, I'm not saying I was a Justin Rose or something, but I was a very good player. That was clear to see. So not you're close to, yeah. Yeah, right. But <laughs> um, you you've got to bear in mind, I wasn't ready to turn professional then. So now I've had four or five years just playing the odd game here and there, and I've gone against professionals, and I just had a breakdown, a golfing breakdown, a mental golfing breakdown. I wasn't ready. Um, I'm not at all ashamed to admit it. My first professional round was 94. My next one was 87. So, so now I'm, I'm literally um, topping balls, duffing balls. I'm making all the mistakes, all the errors, and I'm so conscious of the professionals. Then when my open experience, opening experiences were so bad, I just heaped on me. And um, I had a choice then. Uh, and see, this is another rule that a young amateur wouldn't understand now. If, if they're listening in, if you turn professional in them days, just one event, you were banned from playing golf for two years as an amateur, yeah. all right? Yeah. You could play golf, but you couldn't yeah. play any competitions. Yeah, I know, trying to get the amateur stakes back. Yeah, so I made the conscious decision of give up, go back, uh, wait two years. I'm at, I kept trying, I kept battling. My dad and mum would support me, the little boy they held hopes for, yeah, the little boy that promised his grandfather that would be a golf professional one day, they're seeing me at 94 87, I didn't break 80 in a whole of a year, they're regularly seeing me at 84 or 5, hitting out of trees, hitting embarrassing golf shots, but they never give up on me. So if they never give up on me, why should I give up? So I didn't give up, so I, mm. I, I tidied a few things up and I was... I knew I was a laughing stock. I, I would consider myself the UK's worst golf professional at the time, looking back at it. Um, but I wouldn't give up because I knew what was in my locker. I knew if I could find the key somewhere, there was something in my locker. And arguably, I was I was certainly scarred. But I then decided I, I wanted to eventually broke 80. And that was a little achievement to myself. And competitive 80. I broke a 79. And then... Um, I, I'm a golf professional, but I'd never be a golf professional until I got to a standard at least of winning money. And I won my first check. Um, I bought some champagne, me and my dad. And I think the champagne cost us a lot more than the check. All right. But I celebrated. So I said, right, I'm, I now want to break 75. I've broken 75. I now want to break 70. And... Um, I got to a stage where I went to two French Open qualifiers, final qualifiers, four British Open qualifiers. I nearly got through in 98. It was here, Justin Rose. Yep, back down. Um, got through at uh, Illside we were playing and yep. we were sharing the practice ground with Tiger Woods because how Carl Park was taken then. It was a fantastic uh, um, experience. I played with a Ryder Cup player. Brilliant. Out of my own. I beat more players in the field than beat me. Who did you um, play with? Pierre Falk. Nice. And it was Christy O'Connor Jr., Philip Wharton. I beat two Ryder Cup players that, that, that week over Love two it. rounds. That's unbelievable. Yeah, and yeah, it's a nice achievement for me. So now I'm getting a little bit of something. 
And so, sorry, I read that your, you know, when you got the first check, your wife was caddying for you eight and a half months pregnant, wasn't she? Is that Unbelievable. Right? My, my wife. Unbelie- my was wife, that the first time she had, or should he, she carry? It was my, it was my old, our oldest son. Uh, but no, but she had caddied you for you before. Did you have a regular caddy in uh, for you? Not really. She just no. went around and caddied, and um, I think I played with, with Robert, 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 um, Rob, Rob Dickens, Rob Dickens, I think his name was. And um, I hope you weren't making a carry the bag. No, she was pulling, but I won an extra trolley of them day. She was okay. pulling it. And his girlfriend was a um, a fitness instructor. She was she was in the gym, and she was tired. And my wife, um, she had this. She was obviously heavily pregnant this way because my wife is a, is a slim girl, and and slim face. And the girl, she was amazed when she unzipped the coat because it's a windy day. Yeah, and she unzips the coat and she sees she's eight and a half months pregnant. She's a long time walking in this place. You know, it was at um, Coventry Park as a championship course, a long way round. And she says, I'm tired and you're eight and a half months pregnant. You walk round. And, uh, yeah, so <laughs> got the first check. Um, <laughs> my wife caddy for me. And, um, yeah, so, so, we, so we're, now, we're now broken some barriers. So we, we, we can now play a little bit, yeah. And um, I'll get to 29. I just got a bit tired and stagnant. I was, wasn't shooting. I was just constantly shooting... Not silly bad rounds, but I was constantly shooting three or four over. So it wasn't horrendously bad golf, but it wasn't doing me any favours. Um, and uh, I just got a bit tired, a bit stagnant of not making much money. And um, so I started working on my fitness in a fitness gym in Ethro. And... Um, and I started working a bit more, and I had a boxing gym there. So it wasn't a boxing gym; it was only open to the members, uh, members of the gym. So, so we then start. Um, I start to train, reduce my weight, and uh, I just pondered. I was getting really fit. I just got a nice, got my fitness level right up, and I was starting to think, hey, this is good stuff. You know, it was, it was just just a nice feeling. And I thought, I wondered what would happen if I box because. You know, I always wondered, uh, just ambition as a little boy, mm. you know, uh, uh, boxing, I wonder, I had about 20 gym fights, um, 15, maybe 20 gym fights from 7 to 12 or something. So I've been in the boxing ring in front of a crowd, but they weren't official fights. There were, there were no resulting fights for, for young kids. Skills and bouts. Yeah, skills bouts. They call them skills bouts now. Then they call them gym fights. Yeah. And um, so it was just curiosity killed the cat. And uh, so... I'll turn professional, um, or not, shall I turn professional? So it turned out, and I spoke to a couple of promoters, and I was offered more money, and they said, what sort of ticket sales did you do? I was offered a lot more money as an unlicensed fighter, and then I was um, a licensed fighter. So there was, it, it sounds like unlicensed, yeah. so we're going in because we're from the knuckle background fight. It was nothing to do with that, nothing to do with the rules of the boxing. But at my age now, I'm 29, for me to go in, compete over eight, 10, 12 rounds, it's going to take me five, six years, you know? Not to say that I would have ever got to that stage, because it's, again, it's another thing we would never have known. But um, I went unlicensed over two minute rounds instead of three minute rounds, worked extremely hard. I always deemed myself um, a professional because we got nicely paid for it and we worked- If you get paid as professional. Yeah, we worked very hard at it. Uh, I worked very hard at it. I used to take, um, I used to take four, six two-minute rounds. I'd take 90 days. It was, I probably didn't need that. I used to take 90 days out for a fight. I was Jesus. really trained and prepared yeah. hard. And um, we would do stuff like, uh, I, I, well, me personally, I would, wouldn't have any fried foods, no fizzy drinks, no alcohol, no cigarettes. I didn't smoke. I used to smoke maybe the odd roll up, two or, the odd one or two. I never really smoked anyway, hardly. Um, but uh, all of that stuff, I got the windows. I really took it really? Yeah, serious. So uh, I had my first... Um, two, three, four fights, I was off and running, but I, I was still now playing, playing a bit of golf, so I'm still an active golf professional, and, I'm a, and now I'm actually an active boxing professional, We're running right together. But I'm obviously not doing as much golf, because you, you can't do both, I can't, you can't play golf full time in training, because it, you know, it takes so much energy out of you, you know. Yeah, um, to be at the top of a professional sports yeah. full time thing, let alone two of them, you can't Yeah, do. exactly. So, so we're running parallel, and it was, a, it was a really good thing for my golf. Um, the boxing because I only played two or three rounds this year and I go to the open qualifying at um, Eindead 
Um, nice track. Yeah, and I shoot 71. Excellent. Yeah, pretty good round because the greens are 14 on a stint and 13 and a half. You know, they're light in there, you know, like Ankley. When they had them for the qualifying, they absolutely like yep. putting on, on that tabletop almost. Always quick there. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, go around 71, play off, uh, six man playoff, pile, pile, birdie, get a spot into the final qualifying. Brilliant. Um, two years later, still still boxing, still building up my, um, still keeping my unbeaten run going, thankfully. Um, still boxing, still training. Same thing again. Two years later, go around 71. I think a six seven man playoff, Birdie the first, I will get through. So I'm thinking, hold on a minute, um, I'm hardly playing in comparison. I'm playing like three or four events a year mm. whilst I'm boxing. I ain't come here with any great expectations, but I'm getting good results. So the penny had dropped and I thought, what you need to do is don't expect to try so hard. Mm. So I just went out and relaxed a bit more and it's a very difficult mix, but I tried to relax a, a lot more on my golf and um tough thing to do isn't it yeah yeah but as my curtain come down on my boxing through injury and his age i mean it was getting to that age i was 30. So let's talk to, how many of these unlicensed banks did you have then um i think i'm on 14 i'm just trying Jesus. to go through through my old yeah, yeah yeah i think i'm on 14 i've just um i was just looking at my footage yesterday i did think it was 16 and 13 but i think i've counted it 14. Um, so yeah, so it's, a good, it's a decent run, and um, because I would train so hard and so long, I wouldn't fight like every other month. I wouldn't fight seven, eight times a year. I'd yeah, fight like two, three times a year, because I, I train I train and prepare that hard, I took it that serious. And what was your record, Joe, in those 14? Uh, unbeaten. Fantastic. Yeah. Unbeaten. Fantastic. And you ended up becoming a nicer champion, didn't you? Yeah, yeah London, London champion. So, um, yeah, so, so we're now, now at the stage, and um, we, we, we've got to that stage at 30 four or five and um I, I i i bow out about 30 in my 35th year 34 and something and um so this takes us on to about 2000 yeah so, so now now i get to the best of my um uh professional golf career so so i finish with that and um i now start to say just relax a bit more in 2007 you know um I had my best year and I actually won money that year when I won more money than I spent. So I actually made a profit on oh, tour. Yeah. Let's do that, brilliant. of course. Yes. Fucking hard work. Yeah, uh, brilliant. Yeah, so so I'd, I'd, like for a few years, I had full playing rights on the Euro Pro Tour. Brilliant. I uh, pl brilliant. played um, a event on the Challenge Tour, played an event on the European. I, made, I actually made a cut on a couple of European Tour um, events. I finished second on the Jamiga Tour, finished third on the Jamiga Tour. Um, I, I won pro ams and stuff, but I actually never won on on the mini tours. Yeah. But um, they had all the other places: second, third, fourth, fifth. So 08, 08, 07, 08, 09, um with my best years. I mean, if you think it's not as good as the boys you see on the telly, but I went all around the country in Europe, and I stroke average two thousand and seven seventy three. Right. Back in those days, uh, when the equipment wasn't that much different from yeah. now, but wow. I was only about one and a half shots away from European tour standard in those days. Absolutely you know. Brilliant. So, so it was a really big turnaround mm. and um, I continued playing well. I, I now had friends of mine, good professionals, you know, good professionals who played in majors and stuff. If it was windy and bouncy and dry, which was my probably favoured conditions, coming up, tapping me on the back, saying, you can qualify in this or you can do well, you can do this. So really, you know, I think, hold on, when I look back, these are good golfers telling me I can do things. With I, I was a little bit, um, I was probably not favoured too high hitting um, soft conditions you know, um, in putting competitions. I probably needed more of a, of a tough, probably more, more of the mindset of me as a fighter, to be honest. Uh, I couldn't really fight until I had to fight. And I couldn't, you know, my juices would get going at golf when there were windy, tough days. Strange, really, the parallels mm. with my fighting to my golf. I couldn't spar well. I didn't have no interest in, couldn't over, over spar somebody who wasn't as good. I just yeah, didn't I saw, have it. I saw that you said there's a lot of similarities between the two. Minutes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the nerves, the adrenaline. It, I didn't feel, I just chipped myself in a fight and I chipped myself on the first tee. But the, the, the you know, that's what made me go. So now, now we, we get to stage like, um, and then probably my finest hour, arguably, in the golf stuff is uh, 2011. Me and my son go abroad. We're playing the European Father Son Championship. Um, defending champions, Americans, uh, U.S. Open. Used to play. Uh, used to play golf at university with Tiger Woods. Did Gary Carpenter Jr. Yep. So we get out there. So it was serious. Some other 
uh, father-son professionals, some serious competition out there. And um, we get out there and we manage to pull it off. Mm. You know, we're, um, I think we're like quite a windy first day, one under. Next day, um, but it blows absolutely holy. It plays into my hands. Steady round of level par better ball, which is normally not a great score. Actually, it was the best score of the day. Mm. We, we come in one behind and um, we hung in there, battled in, and my son Reimer, um, I, I held a really important partner 15th. I said, stay with me, I need some help here. Come on, calm down. And he went birdie, birdie, birdie to, to win the championship. Jesus, so yeah. he, 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 did, he delivered the three birdies. It was, like, oh, it was a bit like a racehorse, yeah? yeah? I was whipping him early to make him go faster. <laughs> and then, you know, come on, boy. And then yeah. he steadied up and, and just, he delivered three, three birdies. And I've I, I got to confess, under the pressure, we didn't know where the score, the scoreboards were there. I'm not a scoreboard looker, but... I thought three pars could have maybe have won it, possibly, we didn't yeah. know. And um, I don't know if I could have pulled three birdies off. I can do all the fight and hanging in there, but to pull off three birdies at the end, I'm not sure if it's in my armory, but the boy done it. Yeah, yeah. and I, you were dancing on the final green, weren't you? Right. Going absolutely mad, yeah, nut nutty, Brilliant. yeah. yeah. Um, just, just, well, just, this is great, great. This, I, I, I'm not that good a golfer. Yeah. I'm an okay golfer and I make no bones about it. When I achieve something, golf is so difficult, I'll let you know about it. I'm not going to stand here, I'm not going to sit here I and can, say... I can definitely, yeah. the amount of bad days we have on the golf course, it's exactly. so good at exactly. it, definitely you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell the world, me and my son were European champions. And um, because <laughs> that's what we do it for, you know, we, 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 we do it for that. We don't do it, we don't do it to sweep it under the, yeah. under the mat and keep brilliant. it quiet, you know, brilliant. so... Um, I'll be shouting it from the rooftops. Yeah. We'll have to give my dad a kick up the arse yeah. and get it down the range yeah. and maybe we can get out there. But um, 2011 was a great year for you. Obviously, your book came out in 2011 as well. Is that correct? Uh, 2009, I think, maybe. Just before. So yeah. um, talk a bit, little bit about your book. Um, so what led you to do the book was, and how did it come around? Um, well, I just, I just thought we, it was it was in a it, we were in a era of uh, we we're in a time period where there were lots of uh, books coming out, all the biographies, biographies coming out, etc. And um, it was quite a fashionable thing, and I just thought might not be a good story. So I spoke to an author and and a publisher who would become a friend of mine. Yeah. yeah, and um, very successful bloke coming from. Uh, you know, from from not much himself, and in the terms of he come from a loving family, but as a council estate boy, made it very very successful in business, and he took up this publishing and author business um, just as a, as, a, as a bit of fun to him, and he's very good at that. He's won awards at that as well. But uh, he he just didn't, didn't want to help me. He went down. Just, just blind, point blank told me, we're mates, mate, but I ain't got the time. I don't want to know. He said, put something in writing, and I'll see what it looks like. So I went all right. So I did, but you bear in mind people can't computers, dum diddy dum 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 do it this way. Um, or or other you know, types or even even that's an old thing. But I was handwritten. Mm -hmm. Handwritten and I, I just I just hand print, as I say, Jeez. I wasn't schooled, right? Fair play to you. So I handwritten all this thing and I went, I'll get it all different bits of paper, odd pieces of paper, page numbered it, and I went, there you go. <laughs> Give it to him and he he read the story. He said, I think this is brilliant. He said, I think this is bang on. I think this is really, really good. And um, a book was uh, voted Sports Book of the Year by The Observer in 2011. Yeah. And who was in second spot? Yeah. Tiger Woods. Brilliant. <laughs> Lewis Hamilton was third. He went fast enough. And like I said, guys, fantastic book. And you can get it from Amazon. So there'll be a link below for the book. Yeah. So um, obviously today, right now, you're obviously big in the scrap business. But what? Uh, when did you start getting into scrap business? Or were you doing that throughout all this stuff while you were doing the boxing and the golf? And Well, I was I was actually I was a golf professional for at a golf club for six years. Oh, so you were a teaching yeah, pro? Yeah. Well? I was so a which club was this at? Hounslow Heath. It was oh, my, nice. my old course then when I, got, when I got through out my private one. Of, the public one had me, and um, uh, same, same, same. Um, but as a professional, they allowed me to. Um, my, my good late friend, bless him, Dave Carter, he was the manager for the council there, and uh, he got me the job there as a teaching professional, and would sell a bit of equipment, and I'd play a bit, and between it, we we made a living there for about. I made a living there for about five or six years, but as my family increased, um, we needed to go in. Get a few more quid, and um, and, I, and I turned my attention back to the scrap business, which I knew, yep. and I've been in my scrap business now for 17, 17 years. Brilliant. Yeah.
Brilliant. And so talk to me, obviously you're living in an absolutely beautiful house here today. And so talk to me about, do you miss Thank your you. traveller heritage and traveller roots of actually moving around and stuff? Do you ever think back and miss it? No, if, you, if you turn your head behind you, you'll see my camper van in the front. And so do you get out in that much? Absolutely. We still get out because um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very much on my traditions. Um, Brilliant. I teach my children... Uh, do formal schooling, but I teach them a language, I teach them a cooking, a way of life. Uh, I have to. Brilliant. It's usually important yeah. um, to me. And, um, you know, I don't know what the future holds, but I'll always be, I'm a proud British man, I'm a proud English man. Um, I'm certainly a proud Romany Gypsy. That will remain to the day I die. Um, my children will also remain proud Romanies yeah. until the, the day they die. What happens beyond that? Hopefully they'll, because I've got grandkids now, so they'll be there as well, because I'm already teaching them, thank you. And so what, what age did your kids, kids go to school till? Up until 16, or did they um, leave at an early age as well? Yeah, no, my, my kids all went to 16, except from Joe Junior. Joe Junior's been working with me. He had some home tutor, and he's been working a bit with me. So the others went to the full extension of school. Yeah. And so did you push your children to get into the, the boys to get into the boxing and stuff like this, like what you were at a young age, or did they all Teach up? them, teach them, never push them. Teach them, same with golf, teach them. Um, possibly was a little guilty more pushing them towards golf, possibly, but not much. Um, I learnt, learnt early that not my eldest son was a golfer and a world ranked golfer, um, but I never pushed him. I just taught, I did push a couple of times, but I learnt as a parent, mm. you know, you're getting a bit pushy here, back off. So I'd have a go at myself internally and uh, learn from the experiences, but never pushed them into fight. Pushed them maybe to fight back, learned them how it back. Yeah. You know, that, that I was a, quite up on. Somebody punches you in the nose, punches them back. And, um, but also teach them how to walk away from trouble. That's the first option. You used to teach them that your, your best form of defense is, um, what is it? Well, is it the right hand? That is it, yeah, first, that's it. your best form of defense, have the ability to be nice. Second form is have the ability to walk away. Then the third one, then you go like a lunatic with all your skills intact. But that's that's my that's my, my words to my boys. But they they love boxing. They train, and um, all of them train. They all they all they love it. They have competed a bit, and um, and they're still they're still threatening to possibly compete more. But I won't push them if they do it. They do it under my guidance and do it properly or or not at all. Absolutely. So you're talking about obviously where your life is today and like you said you've been doing really well from a scrap business it's had ups and downs but at the moment you're doing really well thank god and obviously hopefully that can continue um and obviously like you said you've still got the golf aspirations there so hopefully the gout can sort itself out and then you can obviously get back on the golf course 24 7 you know yeah um, i mean yeah so what about the seniors tour and stuff like that have you got um, aspirations to do well on that when you're ready what age can you what age is the seniors tour is that is it 50 or 60? 50. Yeah, yeah, so 50 you, is a professional, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. so have you got any aspirations to sort of jump on that and try and... Well, absolutely, yeah. Um, I'm for, forever trying. I, I mean, I, had a, I must confess, I had a, had a bad golf year this year. I didn't, didn't play well. I, I locked down, um, during lockdown, I had an elbow injury. When I was 30, I had an elbow injury on my right elbow when I was boxing. And, um, and that's a wear and tear injury, basically. So um, I'm now awaiting wait, wait surgery to go in um, uh, privately. I'm going into the city shortly uh, to see a doctor to fix my left elbow. Um, so I've been injured and it's been a rough golf year. I've played around, I can't fully extend my left arm, um, but I can still hit some very good shots. Um, uh, and so I can't, I'm maybe trying to look for an excuse uh, to say that it's the injury, but when I flush a ball, it's going with full power, full everything, no pain. I don't know what it is, but I've had a, Terrible golf year, but I'm still very, very ambitious. Absolutely, um, I want to go through the winter, get this, get this um, injury fixed, get it recovered, please God, and then the other side. And I'm very much trying to play in the Senior Open Championship. Um, I will still qualify. My, my handicap's gone over scratch at the moment, yep. so I've uh, reduced it back to scratch and better. That's the plan, and I'll even try to get into the regular Open. You know, I'll keep trying. And so what is it? You've got to be off scratch as an scratch amateur. Scratch or better, yeah. yeah as an amateur, yeah. And so what's course. your handicap at the moment then? One, 1.6. One. Oh, so you're yeah. not far away. Yeah, no, not far away, but that's... It's, a, lo it's a long way. In the, in the nicest way for me, I'm, I'm not happy with that handicap at all. 
1.6 is too many for me. I'm mm. a bit better than that. Um, you know, I don't claim to be that good, but I'm better than 1.6. Yeah, I've had a bad and painful year as well. I've been Have at you? three at the moment, so um, yeah. Oh, well, well not... you're better than that as well. But hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. I haven't been. Yeah. But um, yeah, I'd like to think I am. So yeah. hopefully, if you put a little something into it, you can come back down. Yeah, absolutely. Way, can't yeah. you? Yeah. And so, another couple of things that are sort of loves in your life. I know um, Brentford's a big part of your life. You're a big football fan, aren't you? I am. I am a Brentford man. Um, so, how long have you been supporting Brentford? Is that since a kid? Or 1979. Jeez, so you know, that I was asked my eight, dad, when you're eight years old, is that? So when yeah. You're 71, 70, yeah. Yeah, I asked my dad to take me to a football match, and he went, oh, there was a game on over the park. And I went, no, real real one. He went, what, you mean professional? I went, yeah. He said, well, your nearest team is Brentford. I said, okay, well, we'll go there. So we did. We played Brighton away. Um, we were 2 0 down. Sorry, we played Brighton at home. We were 2 0 down, and we made it 2 2. So, um, and then, you know, as we got um, self sufficient to get around, me and my youngest brother we really become staunch Brentford fans um, yeah I've read about your brother you and your brother are both yeah, uh, yeah. big big fans yeah and so do you still get a chance to go to many games at this point well, you I go, to get older well it's been yeah we yeah we are but we, we, it's been a bit um, uh, give, crazy couple of years the Chelsea game I give tickets to a friend of mine <laughs> who's uh, he's going through a rough time uh, he, with, with his um, wife Amanda so good luck to Amanda she's not well at the moment but um I, I give him his ticket to, to him and his granddaughter. She really wanted to. Really? She's a Chelsea fan. She wanted to go, and I went. There you go. Um, so I surrendered my my tickets for that game. But no, of course, yeah, I still go. I'm, I'm, and it must be beautiful times for you being a Brentford fan. Oh, wonderful times. It, I, I um, I used to hear my mates talk about Chelsea, yeah, and they would say, "Oh, we we were doing this when we were in the third division," and now I'm uttering the same type of things. Um, we we're in the Premier League, playing well, more than holding our own. We are going to stay up, it's clear to see. Yep. Um, we're a proper football side. We've got a beautiful little stadium here. I'm not a great fan of new stadiums, but our one's really nice. Yep. It's nice ambience. Um, it's, it's, uh, you're never too distant from the ball. Some of these new stadiums, yep. you can't see who number 23 is. You, I can't anyway. But we're right on top of the game. It's, um, we love their old ground, but but you, you we've heard this stuff before, but I remember some of the... Without boring you, some of the memories I have from the old days. I remember, I remember playing um, Bristol Rovers. Uh, we were away, and we needed. Uh, memory serves me right. We needed to draw to stay up, and they needed to win to maybe go up or hit the playoffs. It was something like that. We definitely needed a point. Um, at le- I think it was. A, I think it was a permutation actually, but we ain't got tickets. So, um, but we want to go. It's our team. So we're down to Bristol anyway. Rovers. And um, we see a, three or four of these lads which couldn't get in. How do we get in? If we can get through the houses, because they're ground surrounded by houses. If we can get through the houses. Yeah, I know the ground, yeah. We're getting, but, but we could uh, fucking be deemed here as maybe burgling or something. Anyway, so there's three or four boys are really puffing, puffing joints this long. They were really, oh yeah, man. They were just so relaxed. It was a joke. I said, here, mate, um, got to come straight. We're Brentford fans. We ain't got no tickets. Of all people, I thought, these blokes are so easy. We can't get... I said, any chance of going through your garden? But you're not... Oh, yeah, with their Bristol accent. Yeah, mate, you you want, mate. So anyway, we're going through the back. My brother's, he's six foot eight. He's a huge man. And we try to get this ladder up, this wall. There's a, there's a big wall that supports, it's it's raised. So, so where the gardens at the house are, the car park's actually about eight, ten foot up. And it's just a solid, it's not, it's not a brick wall, it's a solid concrete wall. And we've got to get in this ladder up. And my brother's picked up this ladder He's six foot eight. He's now twenty five stone, but he was twenty stone then, right? He's he's got this wooden ladder. we just a, and it's and it's crowded. I said, John, you're not going to do it, mate. You're not going to do it. He said, Ah, we'll be all right. So he gets up to about the six or seven, eight rung, just about to go to the top. Bang! Comes crashing down through somebody's garden shed. Smash that to pieces. Oh God! Anyway, we've had to leg it. Now we're legging it over people's gardens. We get in, and we make it back right behind. Um, it's got three three sides, Bristol Rovers ground, and it's got no back to it. If it changed, changed then I don't know. They may have even moved, but it's got no back to it. It's just cheerleaders, little 12, 13 year old girls are cheerleading there. There's a couple of other smokeheads there. They've also nicked in, but they're Rovers fans. And me and my, me and my brother's like, see this ball coming over. They've looped this sort of crossy looking shot, but maybe he ain't gone for goal, but it's going right in the top corner. But it's Rovers. Um, kicking towards the Brentford end. And these boys are coming, they're going, get in, and me and my brothers are going, get out. But we can't, we don't want to say nothing, because we, 
Anyway, the fucking thing goes in the net. And then an old bill comes walking over. It's the first time we ever discovered um, that the old bill travel away with the fans here. Yeah. And um, he went, Oi, what are you two doing here? So I thought initially, I thought we're nicked. He went, you're in the wrong end. So he took us, he's kind of nick us or throw us out at worst, you know. And um, or maybe breaking the card and shut up. <laughs> so he t takes us into the um, the, the Rovers end, uh, sorry, to the Brentford end. And we go down. So it was another painful experience. Yeah. Um, your definition of hardcore, you and your brother. Oh, you? absolutely. It's, um, Johnston, I, I done, I done every game home and away, including the uh, auto windscreen or Johnson yeah. paint trophy yeah, yeah. stuff back in the day, up here and round there. And um, absolutely, and all the painful, um, the playoffs, the um, when we did reach those finals of yeah, the Johnston paint, years. all yeah. defeats, defeats, defeats. We were the first and only team. Um, to lose in the uh, lucky dressing room at um, the Millennium Stadium yeah. in Cardiff. So I've been all through that and um, yeah, we, we we had a tasha with Chelsea about four, maybe five, six years ago now. We had a decent little cut run, Chelsea at home, we lost 2-1. So they, they come out, um, they had the bus outside the, the Bramer Road in the old Griffin Park and all these 40, 60 and in them days, under a grand a week players. And we hoosed it, we played really well, we lost 2-1. Yeah. And I said to the boys, I've got a trick here, let's let's give these Chelsea stars some stick. We didn't want the day to end. So I said, give me an answer, what are we going to do? He said, give me an answer. I said, a coach can't reverse by law, or a bus, right? They can't reverse, okay? And they're not, they're not permitted to. I said, really? I said, no. I said, so drag this motor. So we drag this motor in the road, yeah, Braver Road, so the bus can't get by. I mean, no hooliganism, no, 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 no fighting. We just want to have a laugh. Bit of mischief. A bit of mischief. All the fans, oh, you 60 grand a week, this, you, you, you barely beat us, and all this, we're having a right dig on a laugh. A police will come and say, right, you're nicked. I said, oh, anyway, we was a laugh, I'm nicked. I said, what for? He said, criminal damage, you've pulled a car on the road, we've been seen. I said, what, me? He said, yeah, anyway. So just about to nick me. And um, one of the old local police policemen who travelled away, it was the same policeman that took us out of Bristol Rovers all that 20 years before, right? Yeah, took us, took us into our own end. He says, uh, Yes, spiffy, smudgy, so you're normally a good lad. What's, what has he done wrong? I said, tell you the truth, I said, come clean. I said, we did pull the car on the road, but we're just having a laugh. We went up to no wrong, Ken. I said, hey, what for? I said, I just want to give the Chelsea players some stick. I said, we're loving it. I said, we never played them again. And just the weekend gone, we didn't only play them, we yep. gave them a right game. We yep. were a match for them. We, we, we didn't win, but so. But the moral of the story is yes, absolutely. Of course, I enjoyed it. But, yeah. uh, man, so another love of your life is, um, we spoke about it earlier briefly before the thing, is faith. How important is faith to you, Joe? Yeah. And talk yeah. to me a little bit about your faith then. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my faith is everything. Um, you know, I say my prayers in the morning and um, I'm not big enough or strong enough to go against a good Lord. Um, I am not one of these blokes to jump on a chair in the middle of a town centre and waving Bibles around and start shouting, but I, I do it. Um, I meet some lovely people in church and... Uh, during the summer months, I don't frequent that much, but in the winter a bit more. But um, yeah, my good Lord's everything to me. I'm Brilliant. very grateful to what I've got, lad. You've certainly been lucky in life, so it's very lucky. Yeah. Upon you, hasn't yes, it? I feel very blessed. Yeah. Especially some of the things you've been through, some of the situations, all this fighting, bare knuckle fighting, unlicensed. Yeah. And certainly had a couple of scrapes with the law that you've come out of the best way as well, haven't you? So well, I feel very lucky and blessed. Thank Indeed. you. Indeed. And so, um, Recently, your book's been actually re-released, but guys, don't think it's the original one. It's actually been re-released with 11 years' worth of new footage or new material put into it with uh, Martin Knight. Isn't that right? This um, under a different name is now called Kushti. That's that right. Correct? Yep. And so when did the, the re-release book come out? That was very recently, it's, it's it? literally, it just happened a week or two ago. Yeah, it's, it's, it's what the, uh, just, just literally happened. So did you write the the next like bit of material for the book and that? Did you write it with Martin and that? Was it the same sort of process? You wrote it yourself yeah. again? Yeah, well well Martin said to me we got together, we, we stayed in touch with the book, me and Martin, and we're really good friends. And um he said to me, I mean um his friend John King was a, a very successful author. Um from the reviews we had, like from the Observer, um evoking its sports book of the year, etc. etc. It was it was really underachieved by itself, but we were in a world. Um, do you remember the we had the, the world um, 
uh, financial crash. What was the name? Two thousand seven. Yeah, the big crash. And it just, yeah. just after that was yeah. the and, whole world, and, world and, recession. And, you know, yeah, exactly. A world recession. So, but the um, one thing that obviously, like I said, I don't think the numbers did it justice at all. So, agree with you there. But the one thing that is obviously, you didn't really push it yourself, did you? In terms of going out and doing much promotion yourself, like it's really hard to find uh, much on you, and you're a hard guy to yeah, get well, a hold of. Like I say, well, so, I was. Um, yeah, I was just uh, busy doing what I was doing, and I just sat, sat back and, and see where it went. But Martin said he felt it was underachieved. Yeah, um, he felt that um, he re-released um, under a different name. But he said before we go any further, we've got eleven more years. He said, "You bear in mind as the time goes on, we've got eleven years more stuff to talk about." Yeah. What do you think? Is anything interesting in there? So um, I went. Just a bit. Well, when only when you sat back and thought about it, I've had some real. Eyes and lows from from that um, thing. Sadly, I've lost. Um, you know, I've lost uh, my, my my father and all. I lost my mum and dad, and I lost my father and all. I'm very close to. Lost my best friend, my, my my cousin Johnny Fagan, recently to COVID, which I speak about in the book. Rest in peace, um, to all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Bless them all. Um, and other family members and friends I've lost, but I've also had some very eyes. You see, now I've had grandchildren born, um, these are my eyes and the cycle of life if you like, um, and uh, yeah, and my, my, my um, since my last book my baby son um, is born, so I've had some glorious eyes and I've become a European father-son golf champion, I made a boxing comeback in my yep. 45th year, um, yep. I had a two fight comeback, yep. um, so, uh, so yeah, there's been... Um, there's been some, I went to prison wrongfully for prison, not be it long, but I went into prison. And all of these stuff, all of these bits and pieces, um, they make for a good story. And, and um, you know, I'm just blurting them out quite quick now, but they dramatised, unfolded a lot, um, there's a lot more meaning to That's crazy, because you're only a young man, so to be in for all of this at your age is absolutely incredible, isn't it? Yeah, I've, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of more extensions to the book as time goes on. Hopefully. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a busy, been a busy con congested life. That's for sure. Yeah. So, so guys, like I said, obviously you've heard a bit of Joe's story today. Support him, support Martin as well. Get the book. You won't be disappointed. He's got a hell of a story, and try and support Joe. And so, talk to where can people reach out to you personally? Talk to about social media and stuff like this. So you're a hard man to find on there. Talk about Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Are you on any of these ones? Um, at the moment, not. But um, you know, watch the space uh, because uh, I feel um, I'm going to um, actually uh, launch a YouTube Good. channel. Brilliant. And um, I've got some nice footage coming up, so look out for it. I've got some really Brilliant. nice unlicensed boxing stuff in there. I've got a bit of golf stuff on there. I've got some interesting chats and interviews. So look out for that stuff. Um, Brilliant. Anything I can do to help you with that, just let me know. And obviously when you do get that up and running, I'll put a note out on the YouTube channel and all my social media so guys can go over and have a little look at that. Thank you very much. So guys, um, if, you, if you look out at... Um, Christian's channel, we'll maybe fire down a link or a, yeah, so a whereabouts. Where, where are you planning on getting that at then? Or starting that? Uh, shortly. Um, Brilliant. Shortly. So we're going to um, do, um, whilst the book's out, we're going to uh, do our own launch and um, a TV channel launch together. And I'm just waiting on them. Um, I'm literally got all my old tapes and stuff together and some, some interesting chats I've had with various couple of celebrities along the way yeah. people of interest you know yeah. not so much celebrities but a lot to talk to people of interest so yeah so um that's going to be the absolutely. another part of the challenge yeah absolutely fantastic and um another thing we haven't mentioned that i haven't mentioned so i'd like to say a big thank you to charles um for introducing me to you like i said just very hard man to get hold of i just trolled through all the social media stuff trying to find you i found an insta the old one that i don't think you use anymore and then I obviously got in touch with Martin. He was trying to get in touch with you. Yeah. And, then, and luckily Charles came and saved the day yeah. and made it happen. So big shout out to you, Charles. Yeah. Thank you very much for making it yeah. happen. And, um, Thanks, I'd like Charles, say, as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say a massive thank you again for giving me the opportunity to come in and meet you today. It's been inspirational, motivational, and what a great story you've got. Um, hopefully we can do some more parts down the line, and I'm going to introduce you to some other people. So guys, you'll probably see Joe doing a few other podcasts down the line and support him. Great guy with great story. Well, I'd like to, um, on that note, thank yourself, Christian, very much. It's a pleasure to have you in my home. And um, thank you very much, Charles, for introducing us. Yep. And I hope your dad continues to improve. I know he's been unwell. 
bless him yeah, and, same. Um, and same. Um, yeah so uh, thanks Charles for putting this together it's just another friend another uh, part of um, life's wonderful journey that Absolutely. I met Christian today and um, may long the friendship continue Absolutely. maybe over a beer and a game of golf at well, some point you might not be so happy when I take some money off you on the course mate <laughs> All right. Thank you very well, much. Pleasure. Uh, yeah. You know, um, talks cheap. Well, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> but yeah, thank you very much. Pleasure. And till next time. Cheers, thank guys. Thank you.